This week in lab, we will be doing the first part of experiment 20. It's a three-part reaction, or three-part three experiment, um, three different reactions. Um, so we'll be doing part A in lab this week. Your report form part, for part A is also due because, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit, um, because we need to check and make sure that your um, product A is good enough to go on to part B next week, okay? Um, then you have a quiz as always. Um, next week your experiment 17 report is due, and then we'll do experiment 20B in lab. I will also, in lab lecture, be handing out the practice midterm, because then after winter break, we'll be going over the practice midterm. Um, and then, just a reminder, the midterm is Monday, February 27th, um, from 4 to 5 p.m. to okay? All right, I wanted to go over, before I start going over experiment 20, there's a couple things I wanted to show you for experiment 17 processing that I've had some questions about. So when you get into the plot editor for Topspin, so I've just pulled up a random spectrum, I'm in the plot editor. If you right click on the spectrum, you'll get this menu. Click on edit, and this is where you can change things in um, hertz or parts per million, okay? So then if you go on the, D, um, actually sorry, if you go on the 1D spectrum, so in the, move this over a little bit. In the edit menu, go on 1D spectrum, then you have a choice of parts per million or hertz or points for your x axes and for your peak labels. For experiment 17, when you are putting together your um, below up sections for your HA and HBs, you want your peak labels in hertz, okay? But you want your x axes in parts per million. So this is where you change it and then you would apply it and say, okay, and then um, print those blow up sections. Now for the full spectrum, because you're going to print a full spectrum, you want your peaks labeled in parts per million and your axes in parts per million, okay? So you're gonna have to change back and forth there, okay? I just wanted to show you how to get there um, in the plot editor. So that, that is the end of top spin. Does the best job of getting 
to the precursor to the compounds we want. Okay. So you guys should have from your lab props a technician number, right? And so this this table is in your lab manual. So depending on what your technician number is, one through eighteen. For the first step, it's going to tell you what our prime group you're going to have, which denotes your um, alcohol you're using. So 1 through 6, we'll use methanol. 7 through 12, we'll use um, ethanol. And 13 through 18, we'll use one propanol. All right? And so you want to write your pre-lab for the specific alcohol that you are going to use, because you, you're going to use that specific alcohol. Then next week we'll talk about the acid chloride, so you can look here if you want to get ready for next week. Um, if you have a methyl group, you're going to use acetyl chloride, propyl group, you're going to use propanyl chloride, and a, or an ethyl group, propanyl chloride, and a propyl group, butyl chloride. Okay? And then the following week it tells you which esterase you're going to be using. Okay? But the big one for this week is what? what alcohol you're using. So make sure you, you use the alcohol that is specific for your technician because we need, we need to have variance in what we're doing. So we're using three different alcohols and then three different acid chlorides and two different esterases. So that gets us to our 18 possibilities of what happened in that whole reaction sequence. And then we're going to compare those 18 possibilities and see, see what we're um, so for this week, we'll be doing this preparation of an ester via a Fischer or serification, and our R here, again, is poor hydroxybenzoic acid. So in a couple weeks in lecture, you guys are going to be starting um, carbonyl chemistry, and so you'll discuss this in more detail, but I'm going to go through um, the mechanism of, of what is happening with this reaction, and this mechanism is also in your lab manual because it's something that you need, need to understand for this week. So for this Fischer serification, it is acid catalyzed. The acid that we're going to use is um, concentrated sulfuric acid. And so the, the oxygen of the carbonyl is protonated due to that acid. And so that allows um, for more, more facile, easier attack of the oxygen on the carbon of the carbonyl. Because remember, remember, between the oxygen and the carbon, we have electronegativity difference. And so this oxygen wants to attack this carbon. And by protonating the carbonyl, that makes that happen um, more easily, okay? So our oxygen from our alcohol is going to tag carbonyl, and we have movement of electrons. So we get this um, tetrahedral intermediate here. Um, and then water or, you know, some, the conjugate acid, somehow we have something in here that's going to then take our proton that was originally, that's on the oxygen that was originally from our carbonyl, and then we have this movement of electrons as we collapse down and lose water in the reaction, okay? And so then in the end, what we form is this ester, so the R group, remember again, is we're starting with 4-hydroxy, benzoic acid. So this part here is our R group, okay? That is here. Now, um, throughout this reaction, it's at equilibrium. So we have to do things to push the reaction to two products, okay? And so since you're generating, one of the things you have to be careful of, you're generating water and then there, and um, acid um, in this reaction. 
So what you don't want is a lot of water in the reaction because it's going to push it to reactants. Okay? So make sure, like, use dry glassware, things like that. Don't, you want to make sure there's no water present as you're trying to set up this reaction. Okay? Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to use our um, alcohol as our solvent. So we're going to have a ton of solvent. So we'll have a ton of one reactant that will help push it towards products. Right? And so by using a lot of, of the alcohol um, and for a catalytic term, still a decent amount of the acid and trying to keep water otherwise out of the reaction, we're going to push, push this reaction towards products. Okay? Now, this reaction, the Fischer esterification is a, is a good reaction, but it will only, it only works well for um, when we're looking at this portion as far as our alcohols for either methyl or ethyl or propyl. or butyl groups. After that, it doesn't, doesn't really work out well. And as you go through and add more carbon to your alcohol, it also slows down the reaction. Okay? So that's why we're not even trying a butyl group, because it's just so slow for, for what we're trying to do. So this week, the reaction we're going to reflux it for two hours so that we make sure, like our methyl and ethyl people should be pretty good after two hours, but we want to make sure the propyl people have a decent amount of product at the end so that it's, um, you need that two hour time to get that decent amount of product from the propyl um, alcohol. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up this whole reaction before you come to lab this week so that it, we have plenty of time for that two hour reflux, okay? So when you guys come to lab this week, what you're going to do is set up your reflux, um, and everybody will get the reflux going, and then we'll deal with giving out the quiz and any pre-lab information, okay? Um, so make sure that when you come to lab this week, either at 7.30 or one o'clock, you're prepared right at 7.30 or right at one o'clock to be setting up the reaction. Um, now the other thing with this is you guys are all going to start with four grams of this guy, okay? But this, you guys have to calculate how much alcohol that you're going to use. So make sure that you are careful in the calculations that you put together, okay? Um, so everybody will be using varying amounts depending on what alcohol. Make sure that you come in with that calculation ready to go because you need to know how much alcohol from the get-go in volume that you're using. So make sure you put your calculation um, in your pre-lab. Then everybody, we're going to use a heating mantle for heating, okay? Now what one thing you want to do is just be careful. We can... We're going to have this at reflux, so we should be able to keep maintain the temperature of, of the reaction. But we don't want to, like, from the get-go, really char the reaction. So you don't want to, because you've got concentrated sulfuric acid in there, okay? So when you're setting up the reaction, don't, you know, crank it to max on the ohmite to get the reaction and get it refluxing, okay? Just, you know, get it up to, like, 60, 70 on the ohmite and let it nicely heat up. Don't, don't give it max heat from, from the get-go, okay? Now, once you're done with the reaction, then what we need to do is we need to get rid of this alcohol. So the alcohol, we're going to do an aqueous workup after this. So the alcohol will either go into the water, which then we can't be throwing away our aqueous layer if it's going into the water, or it will um, stay in with the product and make the separations a little bit more difficult and we're not getting rid, get, getting rid of the excess alcohol, okay? So, if you're using methanol or ethanol, 
you are going to distill the alcohol. Okay, so you're going to convert convert your reflux immediately to a simple just distillation, just like you did with experiment 17. Okay, except for you are going to use a hot water bath for the distillation. The reason for that is we still got that sulfuric acid in there, so we don't want to overdo it on the heat. Um, so we use a hot water bath for the distillation. So you're going to have to carefully take out the heating mantle that's going to be hot, and then get hot, make sure you have hot water in your pan to convert over your um, reflux over to a distillation. Okay? So distill off as much alcohol as you can with a simple distillation. One propanol we're going to use the rotavaps um, for removing that alcohol. Now that sounds fine and dandy, but one propanol does not come off like hexane and ethyl acetate does. It, it takes a while. So as long, long as you're distilling in your hood, the people with one propanol are going to be trying to pull this stuff off with the rotavaps. Okay? So, um, don't, don't, if you're an ethanol pro, or ethanol methanol person, don't feel like you're getting cheated or anything because you, you may even beat the one propanol people with the distillation. Um, so then, once we have removed the alcohol, we're going to go through a series of washes. Okay? And each of these washes are going to be 25 milliliters. Okay? Um, now, with wash, what does that mean when you're talking about a workup of, of some organic reaction? What, what are we going to do? So we, call, we call from second or first semester. Right, right, okay? So even before you um, start the washes, you're going to add ether, so you're going to get that organic residue into ether, okay? And then remember when we say wash, when we're doing an aqueous workup, that means we're going to add whatever we're washing with to a separatory funnel with our organic layer in there, shake and vent, shake and vent, shake and vent, let the layers separate, drain the aqueous layer out, okay? So one wash is all of those steps, okay? So you're going to do two washes with water. And the reason for this is we want to get rid of as much of that sulfuric acid as possible. Okay. And other other impurities that will dissolve um, in the water. But the biggest thing is trying to get rid of that sulfuric acid. Okay. So you're going to do two um, two washes with water. Then we're going to do a wash with 5% sodium bicarbonate. So why do you think we'll do that? Get, we'll, give, we'll neutralize the remaining acid, and what else will we do? Rem remaining sulfuric acid. And then you will also deprotonate it if there's any benzoic acid in there, you'll deprotonate the benzoic acid. So will you depronate at the acid proton or the phenol? Thinking about pKa's. The acid proton, right? Okay. So this one is to help remove re any remaining sulfuric. We'll neutralize that, and you're going to get rid of your starting material. All right, if there's any starting material left. Okay. Um, and then we're going to do one with saturated sodium chloride. This helps just get rid of any remaining salts or things, aqueous soluble things in that organic layer. It also helps to pull some of the water that may accumulate in that organic layer from all of these washes. So before you even dry with magnesium sulfate, we'll do this last wash, okay? So you're gonna do the four washes 
Um, then you're going to dry with magnesium sulfate. Now, word of caution, make sure you keep everything soluble in the ether layer, okay? Because all of these products are nice white solids, so they look exactly like magnesium sulfate. So it's hard to tell when you go to filter to remove the magnesium sulfate, what is your product and what is magnesium sulfate, okay? So make sure, keep, you know, don't let it just, the organic layer just sit in your hood and let all the ether evaporate. Make sure you keep it covered. When you add the magnesium sulfate, make sure you keep it covered. And then when you go to filter the magnesium sulfate, make sure that you rinse that magnesium sulfate well with um, ether after you filter to make sure you get all, all of the product out, okay? Especially the methyl and ethyl products, they really like to crash out on, on the magnesium sulfate, okay? So make sure you rinse things well. Um, then once you've um, dried with magnesium sulfate, you guys will, everybody will get to run that, okay? Um, and then we'll use the high vacuum pump like we did last week. Then you want to make sure you've got a good yield. So before you do this, it's always good to start with a teared um, round bottom flask. Then you are going to need to prepare an NMR sample. So make sure that you have cleaned out your NMR tube from last week. And you will also need to collect an IR spectrum. Okay. So make sure you've got all of these pieces um, before you leave this week, or at least, at the very least, make sure you've got your um, yield and your NMR sample prepared. You could always come into Open Lab if you had to to collect the IR. Okay. But again, remember you've got you've got the. Um, I'm going to go over the report form here in a minute, but you've got that report form that's due, so you don't want to wait too long on that IR. Okay. So for due dates. <coughs> And this is exactly what is in your um, lab manual. The 20A report form is due on Friday, that is the third, for the Tuesday lab. And Monday, the 6th, for the Thursday labs. Okay? So we'll tell you, you know, we'll give you specific times and so forth this week in the lab. But keep in mind, this, this is when the due dates are. Okay? So let's look at that report form because there's some specifics we need to talk about with that. And then, um, there's a couple other things you'll do with your, your product so you're ready for next week as well, okay? All right, so this is, this is in your lab manual, okay? You're gonna name lab section, technician assignment, what your yield is. You want at least a couple, your yield should be at least a couple grams, okay? So if you go to calculate your yield and it's not, some, we probably lost it on that magnesium sulfate. So I'd wait to throw away the magnesium sulfate in the bucket in the reagent hood until you know what your yield is in case you're rinsing that magnesium sulfate again, okay? Also be careful with all your aqueous washes. So we're gonna do all these aqueous washes. Don't ever throw away layers from aqueous washes and, or any aqueous workup until you know you have your product, okay? Because you don't want to have thrown away the wrong layer, okay? Um, so then draw, draw the structure of what you were supposed to make, okay? In the IR spectrum, you are going to indicate, so you're going to compare your IR spectrum to the spectrum of 4-hydroxybenzoic acid, and you're going to discuss how, what peaks have changed between the starting material and the product. I'm going to post on Moodle the 4-hydroxybenzoic acid spectrum, okay? 
So you'll, you'll look at that on Moodle. You don't need to print it because everybody has the same thing to compare it to. Okay. Um, then you want to make sure that you label the peaks on your spectrum um, for the functional groups between like 4,000 and 1,350. Make sure you include with this an IR table. Okay. Um, and you want to attach your IR spectrum to this form. Okay. The second part here is analysis of the NMR spectrum. So there is not, for 25 points, it's not like you're writing a conclusion or anything like that, okay? It's all spectral analysis and reporting your data. So you want to do a really good job of the d analysis and, and report of your data. Otherwise, there's not a lot here to take points off. So if you miss something, it's going to be worth a lot, okay? So you want to do a really good job putting this together. Um, so for the NMR spectrum, We'll run your samples, and now and then you'll process your data. Um, on the spectrum, on the full spectrum, you're going to draw the structure of what you should have made, okay? And then label protons with letters, and then label the peaks with the letters, what, what protons go to what, okay? So make sure you do a good job with that. A big part of this analysis is you doing a good job with your NMR analysis. Um, then you want to put together an NMR table, just like IR table. So remember, I've posted on Moodle the generic NMR table, or use whatever your lab prop has told you. Um, and then you'll attach your NMR spectrum to this form. If you feel like you need certain regions blown up besides just the full spectrum, then go ahead and do that and attach that as well, okay? Now, as far as how you label things, you most likely won't need coupling constants calculated for this. So if everything's labeled in parts per million, you'll be okay. If you decide you need coupling constants, remember in your peak table just to include hertz, because then you can always go back and do coupling constants later. Okay? Um, then you're going to answer these, these questions about your spectrum. Okay? So in the end, what you're handing in to us, either on Friday or Monday, is this form, NMR and IR tables, and your spectra, your IR spectra and your NMR spectra, okay? And so make sure you do a really good job with the analysis. Now, in your lab manual, for each of these parts, so each separate part, A, B, and C, you're going to, or in your lab manual, in your lab notebook, For each part, you're going to, first of all, each week prepare a pre-lab that is specific for whatever your technician assignment is and whatever chemicals you're going to be using, okay? Then, of course, you re will record your experimental, okay? The other thing you're going to write is a mini conclusion for each part. So part A will have one, part B will have one, part C will have one. You want that mini conclusion in your lab notebook before you start the next part, okay? So you want the mini conclusion for part A in your notebook before you are starting part B, okay? And that mini conclusion should be, you know, a paragraph or two. It's not going to be a full conclusion. What you want to do is summarize the results from that step and summarize what, what the data is telling you. So give yield information, give information about the NMR, give you information about the IR. Um, whatever data is collected, summarize that information. And then you want to make sure that you um, also note if you're going on you know, from A to B or B to C, are you, does your data show that you're ready to go on to that next step? Or are there any issues with your data? Is there you know, extra peaks in the NMR or something like that that maybe could be troublesome to you continuing on, okay? So in addition to the report form, and you're gonna have one for part B that I'll talk about next week, for each part, make sure you get your pre-lab, your experimental, and your mini conclusion in your notebook, all right? So 
So we'll be check when we're checking prelapse for B, we should see the mini conclusion for part part A in your notebook. Okay. Now, um, with your product, so you know we're start we're starting with four grams of four hydroxybenzoic acid for a reason, so that at the end you have plenty to keep moving on with in part C. Okay. So whatever product you obtain from this week, put it in a safe place, label it nicely, know where it is, make sure it doesn't get spilled. I wouldn't just keep it in a way boat or something like that. Put it in some container, a vial, something, so that it is contained and it's not going to disappear on you between now and next week, okay? Because you need it for next week and what you make next week you need for the following week. So keep it, keep it in a safe place. The other thing that your lab manual talks about is next week we will be comparing what happens in part B to your product from part A because you're going to be determining um, completion of your workup based on what, um, what the TLC of A versus B looks like. So what you can do is weigh out a little portion of your A into a small vial and next week you'll be adding ether to that vial, then you'll have your TLC standard all ready to go because that's what you're going to use for your TLC standard. So you're not going to, we don't have, like we've had before, TLC standards for you, the whole class to use. You're going to make your own standards of your, the, the material that you make, all right? So you can have that all ready to go for next week. Okay. We're done quickly. Questions you guys have? <laughs> Nothing? Everybody <laughs> awake? Like, <laughs> okay. If you have any questions, let me know.